Good morning, everybody. I'd like to welcome you to the GSC What's New in SOLIDWORKS 2020 Online Edition. This will be the, I think, 10th time I've rolled out SOLIDWORKS 2020 in the last month or six weeks since our um, Engineer 3D conference back in October. And um, this is going to be recorded as well, so if you need to refer to it back later on, we'll, uh, we'll be putting that out there for you. Also, um, we will be taking questions uh, during this uh, presentation, but I'm going to be kind of answering them at the end. So feel free to type those in as we go, but uh, I will uh, uh, be uh, going through the questions at the end of the presentation. And we will take a break about halfway through because it is about a two hour presentation. So let's go ahead and get started. Every year, SOLIDWORKS has a couple themes when they're talking about uh, what they want to do for a new version of the software platform. And in SOLIDWORKS 2020, the themes are improved performance, streamlined workflow, and connected ecosystem. We're going to be using a Micromax uh, high-speed abrasive water jet uh, designed in SOLIDWORKS by people at Omax Company up in the Pacific Northwest USA. And that'll be sort of our backdrop as we go through what's new in 2020. So to start with, we'll go ahead and talk about improved performance. In SOLIDWORKS 2020, drawings have been enhanced in a serious way in terms of performance with the addition of a new mode of working called detailing mode. So the way this works, in SOLIDWORKS 2020, you just open up your drawing in detailing mode. It's a new mode option in 2020. And it opens up super fast because it's only loading the graphics and not loading any of the model. In fact, the model doesn't even have to be on the system for you to work with drawings in detail mode. Now I can go ahead and see all these different sheets. They come up really lightning quick again, because we're basing it on the graphics and not the underlying model. But this is not just like the quick view mode we had before where I could open something up fast and then print it and that's it. We can actually change things. We can actually add things like notes. So if I have a standard note I want to bring in from our library and maybe kind of reformat a little bit or change a couple of tidbits, and things that you do a lot of in detail mode or detailing can be done in this mode. If I want to get, you know, rearrange some views here, maybe I'll uh, change some dimension locations or others decide to cut this view out of this sheet altogether and maybe make its own sheet. So I'll get a new sheet, create that or order it in the tab list there and then plop this view in there, I can do that. Again, things that you do that you don't need the model for, why even bother loading it? If I have an existing bill of materials and some balloons out there and I wanna add some more balloons or modify the balloons that are already there, I can go ahead and do that in this mode as well. And I can also add dimensions. Anytime I wanna dimension something and use a vertex or an edge or something like that, I can do that right in this mode here. So for location dimensions, most of those kind of things, it's just based on the edges and vertices and things of, of the drawing view itself. So I can do all that stuff right here in detail mode. And I should mention that on my laptop, it takes about a minute and 43 seconds for me to open this complex multi-sheet drawing just to get started in regular mode. And here I'm basically doing all this work in the, within that time using detail mode. Let's go ahead and use a format painter to kind of tidy things up the way we want them to. If I want to um, add things like revision clouds, revision tables, things like that, I can do all those kinds of things here in detail mode. In fact, if you look up at the annotation toolbar, only the things that are grayed out are things that I can't do in detail mode. If I save this, it's just not a special time save, it's a regular save, so next time someone opens this drawing, it'll be, you know, as expected, whether they open it in detail mode or quick view mode or fully resolved mode, doesn't matter. And not only can I save, but I can also save as and export. Like for example, all these sheets, I can just say dump them out as a PDF and do that right here in detail mode. So again, as we look at this, only things that I would need the model information for, um, I would need to resolve the model. So if I want to put in a new bill of materials or do an auto balloon um, or do uh, a whole call out, not just a regular diameter, but a full whole call out, those couple of things, yeah, I would need to resolve the model, which just means I just right click on the model tree and say resolve. And then I wait my minute and 43 seconds to do that. But 
most of the stuff that we do day in, day out, minute to minute, hour to hour, filling out these drawings is stuff that we can do in detail mode without having the model even on the machine. So you think about the power that this gives us to work and create and change and edit our 2D drawings in a quantum leap forward in terms of performance because I'm not ever having to load the model to do these things. That's a huge performance increase for anybody who does 2D drawings, whether you do large assemblies, you do complex tooling or just basic drawings. I mean, my mode of operation now is always open the drawing in detail mode. If I need the model at some point down the road, I'll go ahead and do that, but oftentimes I never need it at all. Now, last year in SOLIDWORKS 2019, we introduced something similar in the 3D assembly kind of realm with being able to use LDR, large design review mode, but still edit some things in it. So last year we, you can open up the assembly in LDR mode, it's super fast graphics only, and then I could add components or get rid of them, add delete mates, change configs, things like that. In 2020, we added more possibilities to that workflow. So now I can create and edit mates to reference geometry inside a component. So I can actually see the reference geometry in my top level components and then um, edit those mates or create new ones to that reference geometry. I can also create and edit standard kind of component patterns. So if I want to do a, a, a circular pattern or a, a linear pattern, I can do that right in the LDR mode. And then also some UI stuff was kind of added in. So like, you know, if you're, if you're like me and you're used to hitting shift and tab shift to hide and show components and things like that, you know, a couple of those things, copy, paste, stuff like that didn't work in edit in LDR mode on the first go around last year, but those things do work now. So the typical sort of moves that uh, uh, someone who does assemblies would, would uh, just have, you know, as a reflex now work perfectly fine inside of LDR edit mode. So again, we're just adding more performance tools. And I should also mention too, that last year we added the new graphics pipeline in SOLIDWORKS 2019. And that new graphics pipeline was available uh, as a beta functionality all through the 2019 cycle. So um, if you want to turn it on, it was one of those things where it's like, hey, you're using beta software, it wasn't really used for production. That's all done now. So we have the new graphics pipeline, which takes advantage of modern graphics hardware and SOLIDWORKS for pan, zoom, rotate. We have all that fully released and on by default in SOLIDWORKS 2020. And in addition, it not only applies to 3D models, but also applies to 2D drawing geometry on the screen too. So all of our pan zooms and rotates, whether we're doing 3D models or 2D drawings are gonna be just accelerated as well, just as a matter of course, by using SOLIDWORKS 2020. Another new performance enhancement in SOLIDWORKS 2020 with relates, with relates to assemblies is a new way of working where we now can use envelopes with external references to top level components to make it easier for teams to work and also make it faster to work with large assemblies. So you have something like this mechanism here and there's a bunch of sub assemblies in here. And maybe there's a couple of different individual people or teams that are gonna work in these sub assemblies. In order to have those people be able to work with things in the position at the top level, they're gonna to have to always have the top level open and referenced. But now in SOLIDWORKS 2020, I can take some top level components as I decide, and I can say, I'm gonna publish a envelope reference of those top level components into the sub assemblies. What that allows me to do is not have to have the top level component assembly open or even on the system. I can open up this sub assembly by itself and the top level bracket that I need is now represented as an envelope part. Now envelope parts have been around for a little while, but to kind of refresh people's memory, an envelope part is a representation of a part, but it does not count for calculations and the mass property things, centers of gravity and stuff like that, nor does it show up in bombs. So it's a representation, it's a ghost reference, if you will. Now being able to have that inside of the subassembly allows me to open up just a subassembly by itself, don't need the top level, I can mate all my stuff up to the top level representation in the, uh, with the envelopes, and then whenever we do roll up and go to the top level, I can see that, oh yeah, everything is mated correctly and positioned correctly. So unlike just, you know, hey, graphics are faster, you know, detail mode is a thing you can just do, or LDR edit mode, this is a little bit different of a workflow kind of thing you're gonna wanna incorporate and explore and incorporate most likely in your workflows. And it works great for people who work with large top level assemblies and have a bunch of subsystems that, you know, they really just wanna be able to work independently on. 
also, even if you don't have large assemblies, but you have indiv individuals or small teams, even ones that are off site, this is a way to empower them to have the information they need from the top level into the sub assembly as a self contained item so they don't need to open or even have the top level assembly around to do their work. So it's a kind of a game changer, kind of a twist there in SOLIDWORKS 2020. Definitely something you're going to want to look into and uh, try to incorporate, I think, in, in most people's workflows if you're working with assemblies with, of any size or with uh, more than one person. So that's kind of a short, a short segment, actually. Uh, if you look at the three segments here, and I told you it's going to be about two hours of, of work here. So improved performance is flat out, hey, the software is faster. That's what we have, and they're pretty big. It's, it's not a long list of them, but they're pretty impactful across the board. You know, anybody doing drawings, anybody doing large assemblies, or anybody working in assemblies with, with more than one person, these are things that can really help performance in a profound way. If you look at the next segment, though, we're talking about streamlined workflow. So now we're not talking about just the software being faster. We're talking about being able to get from point A to point B with fewer mouse clicks, using fewer tools, eliminating the need for any kind of workarounds. And this is kind of across the board. I've assembled sort of a, a large segment of, of what, what we have in terms of streamlined workflow, but actually every part of SOLIDWORKS platform, including the, the, the applications that run outside of SOLIDWORKS, have streamlined workflows everywhere you look. So let's take a, let's take a, a look at some of these, the, the, my favorite ones here. So one of my top five favorite things in SOLIDWORKS overall, in addition to having detailing mode and, uh, and uh, being able to publish envelope parts in subassemblies, those are two of them. My third one um, is flexible components or what I call squishy parts. So if you look at the tilted jet assembly, which is kind of the heart of the OMAX um, abrasive water chip, you know, they're high speed, high precision, you know, they're the, the secret sauce here. You know, this is modeled in SOLIDWORKS and it's a bunch of sub-assemblies and some of them are flexible. So I can kind of see the range of motion. And that we've been able to do it for a long time. I can do collision detection or static interference or whatever. But in real life, some of these components are gonna be protected by some, you know, boots and rubber boots or some, some um, coverings, you know, those are gonna be flexible or squishy components that, you know, yeah, I can model those in SOLIDWORKS, I can represent them here, but they're not going to update or, or change with the model itself as it goes through motion, right? In SOLIDWORKS 2020, I can actually make that happen. I can make a part flexible. And what that does, it allows me to assign one degree of freedom from the part to a individual instance of a component at the top level assembly. So now when I move this, this uh, tilted jet around, when SOLIDWORKS, uh, let go when SOLIDWORKS updates, it'll actually update that geometry. So I'm able to actually take that, and that's a per instance situation. So I have a second instance of the same part, the same boot there. I'm gonna assign its degree of freedom on the top end of that spline to be concentric with this other ring elsewhere in the assembly. So same part, multiple instances, and I can just have the system automatically let me reassign that one degree of freedom for things like springs, living hinges, bellows, boot coverings, things like that. This really allows us to start incorporating squishy parts in as responsive items into our assembly motion. Now, this is brand new in SOLIDWORKS 2020. There are two caveats just to let you know how this works. First of all, you have to have one degree of freedom and one degree of freedom only in the part itself. So that's something that can be assigned to another part at the, at the top level of the assembly. And the other thing is these have to be top level components. So all your squishy parts will be at the top level. So you can assign them to top level components to, uh, to, to basic reference. But that gives us the ability to do this in a very unique, and again, I'm not making different configurations per instance. It just does it automatically. It's really easy to do. The QuickMate toolbar has been around for about five years now. This is where I just click a couple pieces of geometry, a couple parts of my assembly, whether I pick faces or edges or vertices or whatever, and we get suggestions, hey, you want to make this coincident or concentric? Very popular way to do you know, standard mates, and as we continue on, people are looking to do more kinds of mates in that same manner. So in SOLIDWORKS 2020, we actually have some nice enhancements to add other popular mates to that.
let's take a look at this example here. So what I have here is I have a washer and I want to make a twist slot. So I just pick the washer and slot geometry right on the screen and now I have the option right in the quick mate toolbar to do a slot mate. So, you know, all the constraints are there. If I pick two faces, I can do a center uh, profile mate, which has been around for a couple of years. But one thing that happens with these kind of things is that the direction is going to be the nearest one. And that's wrong. So you can see now when I do these mates, I have a flip mate alignment glyph right there. Let's do it again. I'll pick four faces of geometry between two parts. It's going to set up a width mate. And again, it's going to just center and width and let me do the uh, the constraint style. But it's going to use the orientation that's closest. And now I can go ahead and flip it. Before, I have to kind of manually rotate one of the components so it's in the right orientation so it'd be the closest one or I'd have to go later on and edit that. And oh, by the way, when you do these now and edit things through breadcrumbs, you can do flip mate alignment as well. So before to flip mate alignment, you kind of had to do it and then go back and edit it. Now it's on the fly. And other things that are on the fly too are limit distance and limit angle. So I pick a couple of parts you can say, I want to limit their angle and just say, okay, I'm going to start at 45 degrees, I'll do max at 90 and min at zero. Again, I, these are not new mates. I just had to go to the paperclip command and, and go to the left-hand side and go through all that. And now more of these mates are right on that quick mate toolbar. I click on a couple parts and I get options and do it right on screen. And as we know, when we put assemblies together, we spend a lot of time putting things together with mates. So the faster we can do that every minute, every hour, every day, that just overall just makes things go faster. Assembly of patterns and a lot of different ways have been enhanced in SOLIDWORKS 2020 as well. And some of them are complicated patterns, some of them are not. So let's take a look at, at a couple of instances. So one of the popular assembly level patterns that people do is pattern driven patterns. So if I have this part, for example, and I have, or this assembly and I have whole wizard holes, what popular thing to do is just, hey, everywhere I got a hole, put in a fastener. Now in SOLIDWORKS 2020, when I do that, it'll actually read the direction of the holes. But before in SOLIDWORKS, it would not know how to do that. So it would always have the seed orientation, which means that half of these would be facing the wrong way. So what would I do? I'd have to put you know, two patterns in, one for one side, one for the other side. In 2020, that's not a problem. I can just basically just have it read the direction of the holes. But I'm doing linear and circular patterns in, of components in SOLIDWORKS 2020. As I do this, I can say, well, I want to go around this axis. I want to have X number, like, okay, we'll have eight of them at 45 degrees, but now on the fly I can say, okay, except for this instance here, I want that angle to be different. Or likewise, I'm doing a linear pattern. I'd like, I want five of these spaced one inch between, except the third one's gotta be spaced an inch and a half for some reason. So before I had to skip an instance, put, put its own thing out there or modify after the fact, now I can just make those variations right as I create those patterns. When we mirror components in SOLIDWORKS 2020, we now have another option for centering our mirror operation. So before we've had bounding box forever, center of mass a couple of years ago we added, and now we also can use, in addition to that, we can choose to use a, a component origin. This is great if you have a common origin for assembly that you make your subsystems um, around, so this way it's all oriented. Now we also have pictures of each of the different orientation options as opposed to a list of words. This makes it easier to get the right result without multiple clicks. So just basically you're able to do more powerful patterns, so fewer patterns and fewer workarounds, just have more control over these things. Sketching is sort of the basis of modeling in general, right? Most, most everything starts with a sketch of some form or another. And as we look at SOLIDWORKS 2020, we have some nice enhancements. Some of them are future looking, some of them are things that people have been asking for for a long time. So we know that people are getting more and more into touchscreen displays. And with whether using a finger or using a stylus here, and we're going to be able to accommodate that. I do some gesture-based stuff, put in some dimensions, and I can dig right on the screen because you know we're not assuming that you have a keyboard, and you might not in the future right, as you go. So we can always do this stuff. We've been adding, you know, basically interface elements and enhancements as we go. So drag a point to a center point, center of a edge, and it establishes that relationship, things like that. In 2020, we have more gesture-based modifications, though. So instead of using that right menu do things like trim or sketch uh, modifications, I can just kind of do a squiggle and go through geometry and it'll interpret that as a trim. Or if I do an angle, it'll give me a, a, an end there. It'll say, oh, you must want to do a sketch, you know, 
chamfer or a curve of sketch fillet that can do some more of this. So we're not saying that people are gonna uh, tomorrow start using just exclusively touch screens to do their sketching, but we do know that people move toward it as, as this hardware becomes more, more um, available, we're gonna wanna be able to make use of it in SOLIDWORKS and not have to have some other add-in or tool or some major you know, program effort to do this. So we're just kind of adding this as we go and it's getting pretty good. You know, if you have a touch screen, you might wanna try some of this stuff. For anybody who's doing industrial design, um, this is a big deal, however, this next segment coming up, where I actually, you know, have two sketch splines that are completely discontinuous. They're not even tangent, right? So we can do tangency or, t or C2 continuity, but now in SOLIDWORKS we have C3 continuity. So that's a torsion matching as well. And we can do that in SOLIDWORKS sketching in 2020. So that's a kind of like the holy grail of, of uh, curvature control and smoothness for splines in uh, 3D modeling. We now have that in our splines in 2020. Also, when you undo, if you ever hit Control-Z a bunch of times and then got out of the sketch, you realize you could not control R and go back into the sketch. Once you got out of the sketch, your, the undo buffer was, was erased. Now in 2020, not a problem. If you hit Control-Z um, three times and you only need to hit it twice and you step out of the sketch, hit Control-R a couple of times, it'll get you right back into the sketch and you can continue on. So that's a little bit nicer. Something that people have asked me over the years, again, people that do package design, different things like that, about silhouette entities. And now we have this, and it's very simple, and it's also very robust. My brother and I have tested this quite a bit over the last several weeks. If I have a body and a part, or I have a part in the assembly, now we have a new type of convert entities called silhouette entities. I can choose to do just the external silhouette or all the silhouettes, and it's like the flashlight shining through or around it, and it just projects that straight on. And whether that that thing is perpendicular, whether that is angled, we've done all kinds of weird revolves and lofted pieces and projected off of that and it's robust. It is very, very, we haven't gotten it to fail yet. So this is something, again, if you do certain kinds of, of package design or things like that, this can be very useful. Just understand that now we have that and it's converting entities, it just goes around any you know tangent edges, sharp edges, whatever it is, it's literally, the flashlight projection uh, onto a plane, which is really, really helpful in many situations. Markup is something that was introduced last year. This is brand new from 2019. Basically, I have a 3D model and I wanna mark it up right on screen. I can do that. And again, stylus, so you can use your finger if you just have a touchscreen laptop, like my last five laptops are touchscreens. I can just do this. I can go ahead and rotate around. In 2020, we created a separate markup command manager and toolbar, so it's easier for people to see the commands. They were just not, before they were sprinkled in, the, in other toolbars. And as I do this, I hover over the markups in the tree, and it gives me like a nice little preview so I can kind of see if I get like eight or nine of those, which one's which. I can orient myself to those markups at any time so I can see where everything exactly face on there. I can also individually or as a group export these markups as TIFFs or JPEGs. If I want to do that. But one of the things that people wanted to really see in last year was being able to do this in drawings. And the cool thing is now in 2020, we can do markups and drawings. This is probably one of the most asked for enhancements from last year, actually. Like, that's great, but can I do it in drawings? Why not? Now you can. So it works the same way. You're just marking up, you write, you scribble, you circle, you do whatever you want to do. Now this is your pen on your drawings. And as we create these markups, we can hide them individually or I can go to the eyeball and hide them globally if I want to. When I create these markups, before I have to have a touch screen, what if you don't have a touch screen? Now you can use a mouse. So it's a little bit like drawing with a brick, I'm not gonna lie, you know, it's not as nice as having a touch screen, but now everybody, regardless of their hardware, can create their own markups because now it can be not just touch screen, but mouse driven as well. So as an example of SOLIDWORKS adding some functionality brand new in one release, and then the very next year, having user-driven um, enhancements that really make it that much easier and useful to the user base. Now, the last few years, we've been able to do more and more with mesh geometry. Now, remember, mesh geometry is different than regular SOX geometry, which is nerves-based. So mesh geometry comes from like art programs like ZBrush or Google SketchUp, scan data, et cetera. And one of the problems with mesh geometry, mesh files, is they're so darn big. There's like a zillion facets in them. 
So in 2020, we have a new tool that says that we can decimate mesh bar. I'm going to say take half of the half of the the uh, nodes out of here, and it does it intelligently. It might take a few minutes to run and hit a little time lapse there, but it does it intelligently. So you still have the general shape there, but it's kind of taking all that weight out of it. Also in 2020, we can create reference geometry from this. So I can say I want to select tangent facets, and within like a 15 degree or seven degree or whatever. Kind of because again, this is these are flat facets really that we're doing here. This mesh geometry, I can use that interpolate and then create myself a nice center axis. Why would I do that? Because I want to create this with SolidWorks geometry using sketches, maybe referencing the mesh and stuff like that, which we had tools introduced a few years ago. Now, as I'm done, I might want to check the status of this with my SolidWorks geometry and the mesh geometry. It looks like now our body compare allows us to compare mesh and regular SolidWorks. V wrap together. So I can look at those, get kind of a heat map of where I'm where I'm a little off more than the others. I mean, I'm really close in general. Where I see this being useful is if you're there's a keyway in there or a couple of holes that maybe I forgot to model. This will show them up in red really easily. And I'll say, oh yeah, I totally forgot that. Let me go and get those. So Addition to that, we now, for the first time in SOLIDWORKS with 2020, have the ability to directly edit mesh bodies. Before, we could, you know, the last couple of years, we could what, you know, create faces off them and surfaces off of the off the, the mesh geometry and work with that. Now I'm just saying, this is like an STL file, right? And it's STL is a mesh body. I'm gonna go ahead and just break these edges. I can just make them, uh, you know, chamfer or I do a, do a uh, uh, fill it or whatever, I can do that directly. I can offset a SOLIDWORKS nerve surface off of this, these facets, which I could do before. The difference is I'm going to use that SOLIDWORKS surface after I extend it to make sure it's a good cutting tool. I use that SOLIDWORKS surface I just created to cut the mesh body directly. Again, we could not do this before. This is a new era in SOLIDWORKS. Um, as we continue and look at some of the things I can do, like repair Damage, again, mesh files can come from anywhere. Again, scan data or whatever. Uh, sometimes things are missed. Uh, they're not part of, you know, from they're not created as part of the uh, the mesh file, for example. I can treat these gaps. I can treat these, these faces just as if they were a surface model. But again, this is a mesh model. So as we look at this kind of, this is in the very beginning stages where we can do some basic, simple modification of of mesh geometry in SOLIDWORKS using regular SOLIDWORKS geometry and not converting back and forth, I'm sure this is not the end of it. This is just the beginning of being able to do this. Something completely different would be an age-old issue that is not just in SOLIDWORKS but any solid modeling system. When I have fillets and I put them toward the end, which you normally do uh, with your model, things under before that in the model history can change and your fillets can be kind of orphaned, right? So if you look at this original model, it was created just with one sketch and a simple extrusion. I wanna modify the original extrusion so it only looks at the outside circle and then I'm gonna use that same sketch as it to create a second feature. So this will be, so the, the cut is a separate feature, you can suppress it or whatever. So it's not just one feature, it's two. Now topologically, I have the same exact number of edges and stuff. But the names have changed because they change how the model is put together. So what happens as I roll forward, and you've all seen this when you model, change your models, is that the fillet needs help. I don't know where these edges are. What's new in SARS 2020 is I can right click and say repair all missing references, and it will do its darndest to automatically create or repair all that. Now, in the case of where I don't have any topology change, it does it 100% because it knows, oh, it's just a different name, but it knows in space where the, the edge was. So it does a great job with that. Most of the time when you do something like this, it's going to be a situation where some edges are new or there's some, some edges were taken away, um, and then a bunch of the other edges are no topological change. So what this will do is it'll basically take, you know, as I say, 80% of the stuff is the same, but a couple edges are different, either new or, or, or deleted. What's going to happen here is it'll do automatically 80% of it for you in that repair, and then you'll just go ahead and help it figure out what to do with the new edges or what to ha what happens with the old edge references that those edges start there anymore. So it does some of the work for you. So same command we've always had in terms of it's just a fill command, um, but now when we edit it, we're able to get the information the software already knows and do some more have it do more work for us, take the grunt work out of it. 
That's also the case in the surfacing um, offset surface command, which is kind of one of the most basic surfacing commands there are. And whether you use surfacing like twice a year or every day, the surface offset command just got way, way easier and faster to use. If you take a look at this housing on the back side of our, of our um, Micromax here, it was created with you know a surface and an offset, right? Well, if I want to change the size of that, I'm going to offset that surface amount. Well, if, if I offset too much, the small faces can't be done. Now in SOLIDWORKS 2020, it didn't just say it, it failed. What it does, it tells you, here's what I can do, here's what I can't do. These little guys, I can't offset that much. I can just tell, hey, SOLIDWORKS, you know what, those little guys, just forget I even mentioned those. Don't try to offset those. So I'll offset, I'll SOLIDWORKS offset the faces it knows it can do, and then I can go ahead and just manually recreate services directly because again, you can't offset beyond the size of a surface and go ahead and recreate those, create those services to tighten this up again. Before again, what would you get? Just a fail and then you'd have to maybe offset some services and guess at what that is. Here, it's the information that's always been inside the command. Now we're just adding it to the UI and being able to do some useful work. We can have SOLIDWORKS do the work for us and let us only have to worry about what really is new or what really is not able to be modeled. Oh, by the way, you also, when you thicken from a surface, now you can go bi-directional, not just in or out. SOLIDWORKS MBD has been enhanced in that last several, many years, actually, I'd say many at this point, with the idea that as people move to a drawingless environment, which again, military, um, you know, aerospace is doing this, you know it's gonna continue on. It is a better way of doing it. I had a 3D model, hey, just, Put the PMI on there, put the dimensions and the geometric tolerances and notes and everything else on there. If I want to look at it from top view, I'll just rotate to a top view and see what's there. Okay. Much better way to package it. And we've been spending a lot of time the last several years just adding tools so you could fully define things. Now in 2020, we've we haven't been adding a lot of that because we're kind of pretty much there, but we're doing things like making the UI easier to to um, for work with people that are consuming the data. So I can see all the items as I click on them, they highlight and it's in the graphics window, et cetera. The names of the features now actually have the name and the, the, the names of the dimensions actually have the name of the feature and the value of the dimension on there. So it's easier to find them. They're organized in the front, top, right side view. So it's easier for me to, again, find where these dimensions are because it's our top view. I can see where they are under that list. I can also sort this differently. So if I want to see all my smart dimensions and then I see all my geometric tolerances and all my datums and my service finishes, all those, again, can sort them separately again, so that way it's easier for me to find and consume the information inside the MBD technical document package, which I have built up here. So what we're talking about with 2020 are some enhancements. And again, you know, there are 6 million users of SOLIDWORKS around the world. The number of people that are, that are doing MBD right now is a, is a small percentage of that. So those folks, as they're piloting this and as they're implementing this in their companies, and I know some companies that have several hundred seats of MBD uh, piloting right now, what we're seeing here is they are driving the enhancements because they're using it. They're saying, hey, this could be better. We'd like to be able to do something differently or additionally. And if you are uh, looking at going into this, into this mode of operation the next couple of years, when you jump in early, you have a, a big voice in a relatively small group of people working with development. So that's just something I would put out there for you. Drawings, um, again, it's talk about MDD. Yes, that's the future for sure. But you know, every time I go to any, any of these rollouts and I ask how many people do drawings, almost every hand goes up, right? So what 2020 is allowing us to do is continue on the all uppercase kind of crusade, right? So we could say all uppercase for notes or look at a table and say you're all uppercase no matter how you were typed in. In SARS 2020, I can say everything's uppercase in terms of dimensions and a whole callout. So as people put in DIA, for example, or other things in dimension, they don't capitalize. Zap, now it's capitalized automatically. That's cool. But there's other things that we've done also in 2020, again, from a workflow standpoint which I actually am really liking as I use SOLIDWORKS 2020. I thought these would be minor things, but they're actually really, uh, really helpful as I continue on using 2020 in my, in my regular daily work. So for example, drawing scale. So it's been many years since we've had the ability to just drop down in the SAS bar and pick a drawing scale. But you know, this, this list was not mine. It was just you know, what the system had. Now you can actually determine what's in that list. 
it's driven now in 2020 by a simple text file. So ANSI or ISO, whatever standard you have, just change what that list is, add in your own custom scale amounts, and that will be available in the dropdown. If you're going to do it, uh, change sheet properties, you know, the scale through sheet properties is not that hard. You just have to kind of go into a dialog box. Now in 2020, I can just do user defined right here and just type in whatever, two thirds or whatever I want and do it. So it's direct, I'm not going in a, another dialog box. Likewise, for views that I create that have a different scale on them, it's a detail circle, again, there's the default, right? The two to one, but now right on the fly in the property manager, I can change it to be whatever I want. Whereas before I have to place it and then change it after the fact. Again, just taking a more direct approach. This I really love because I happen to like chain dimensions more than baseline dimensions. This is how I kind of learned it. So as I do chain dimensions now in 2020, they're automatic and you line up and they just build on each other like the baseline. And in fact, you know, I can also do a right click and just say, oh, let's just have an overall. And it's intelligent. So if I take things out of the stack, the overall changes, if I take things out of the middle of the stack, you know, the neighbors will take the slack, if you will. And now we have this automatic kind of chain dimension we can convert from chain to baseline or vice versa. And even better, you can now use these automatic chain and baseline dimensions in your sketches in your 3D environment. If you ever have a situation where you have a cast or a mach cast in, as machined, or you want to show a part in different stages of development in a drawing, you can now do that. Alternate position view, which we've had for assemblies, now works for parts. Basically, it's not you have to think of it as it's not really alternate position view, it's overlay configuration. So now I can see this part as, you know, in the two different aspects of it, I can dimension off of that, see where, where we're taking off the machining material away. Very nice in those situations where you didn't have a good solution to show that I've drawn before. So a lot of nice things, again, things right out of enhancements that people are asking for um, in SOLIDWORKS 2020 to make the workflows faster and shorter. Now, structure systems are another thing that were introduced last year, and we've really got a lot of new enhancements as well. But I'll kind of review how this works. So if you're doing welded structures, and we've had weldments for a long time, but for systems like this, I mean, it could get cumbersome to sketch in 2D or 3D all of the paths that these members would take. So structure systems keeps us from having to do that. It's a different way to build this up, and I, it's what I've really grown on me. So if you look at this, this structure system was created with just basically one sketch, a sketch line, a couple sketch points, and we have some reference geometry, a center axis and four planes. As we create the structure system, they need the primary member, which I'll just go ahead and use these sketch points here. And we can daisy chain those now in 2020. So before it'd be one to one, I can just keep clicking. Another cool thing we can do in 2020 is we can have um, shared endpoints. So I can say these two points to one, and it'll go ahead and let me share them that way and go up to a point and go up to a plane as well. So all three of those points will go up to a plane. I'll take one away. And then also I can change the direction too. So it's normal too, unless I pick an edge or some sketch geometry to reorient the direction. Now, when I have these primary members in place, I want to do secondary members, which hang between the two primary members. And I'll just say, okay, between two primary members, and I want one for each one of these planes. You'll lay that on there. I can mix, it, mix and match different uh, profiles. So I don't have to use the same type of steel profile for the whole thing. I can mix and match that. I'll just change the, how those are trimmed in there or how those are oriented in there. And then as we create these members, eventually we'll have to trim that out if they overlap. Now in 2020, I can just split the members directly as I create them. But before I'd be overlapping them, then have to go and do a secondary trim operation. Here I can just do it directly. I know what I want to do in terms of splitting and just do it on the fly. And once we're out of this, then it's then the corner management tools in the company to say, hey, how do you want me to trim things? You know, it's going to have its own defaults. I can change order, for example, like, okay, there's a three come together, which one's first, second, and third. Just kind of help it along. And then with this, a few decisions that I give it, it'll go ahead and properly trim all these members out. Each piece of steel has got its own body. I hide this. You can see how it handles that quite nicely, according to my wishes. So that's one structure system I just created. And what I want to do is I want to pattern that. In 2020, we can pattern these. I can do a circular pattern. And not only can we do bodies, which we can do before in regular weldments, but I can also just pick one member of the whole structure system and it'll let me go ahead and pattern the whole thing as one shot. So that's a very powerful way to get a lot of that geometry out there. 
I'm going to make another structure system. I'm going to skip the primary. I'm going to reuse some primary members from the first structure system. I'm going to lay secondary members on these planes again between the front and back pairs there of the primaries for those two pattern items. And again, I'm going to change the pierce points so that they're flush at the top and they're all the same, those I beams. And as I get out of the structure system, it's just, again, okay, help me with the corners, give me some guidance in terms of how I'm supposed to trim these, planar, coping it, whatever, order for, for more than two, stuff like that. And then after that, it's done. So again, now let's go ahead and pattern it. Use the same axis. And I'm just going to pick one of these members out of the eight I just created. They'll know that they're all part of it. And then again, within just a few minutes here, I'm able to create this really complex system with, what do I look at that? 204 items in the cut list automatically. And it's all parametric and created with just a little bit of sketch geometry and some reference, reference geometry. So if you're like me, when it came out last year, it's sort of like, okay, it's new. It's tried it a little bit, but I, I kind of used the old system because I was doing some, just a couple things and, now, as I look at this and get more involved with it, I'm thinking, you know, I'm going to be, even for small things, I'll be using structure system because it's just so much faster. I don't have to sketch very much at all to just kind of, in my mind, grow this thing, basically out in space and create these systems. Some other things you'll notice in the UI, some of them are subtle, some of them are, you know, right away when you start using SARS 2020. For example, the open dialogue. Now in SARS 2020, You'll notice that not only do we have the open types you know, more sorted, but we have this mode right here. Depending on a drawing or assembly or part, you have different modes. And I have a slider, and I can see all the options of each of those things. I can kind of get a better idea what each mode does. So that's new kind of, you know, oh, that's an in-your-face sort of thing. You'll see it right away in 2020. So more subtle that you're going to maybe notice is that we have more tool tips, and they have more information. In some cases, not just explanation, but also graphics, whether they're static or whether they're little animations. This is useful for not just new users of SOLIDWORKS, but think of tools like maybe you use sheet metal only a couple times a year. This is a way you can hover over things and kind of get more guidance as you use them. You can now drag multiple features um, at the same time into a folder if you want to structure your, your tree like that. One of my little favorite things here is now we can do searching in the material library. So if I'm looking at 304 steel, I can start typing 304. I don't have to go into, you know, steel and go find it and click on it. I can just go ahead and just start typing. I love that Google style search, and it's being more and more pervasive in SOLIDWORKS all over the all the time. In simulation, again, some shortcuts, some making things faster and easier. Again, because not everyone is in simulation you know, every day, all day. I really like some of these enhancements here to the UI. So one of them is um, just being able to use uh, the shift C to be able to collapse the tree, which you could do with the regular feature tree. Now you can do it and it works with your, your simulation tree. Simulation evaluator, I love this. This is basically a one-stop shop for all the possible settings you might have, like where's my file locations for my, my, my temp files and things like that, all that stuff. You know, what are, where are my results listed? What are my materials? Make sure I got all that going. I can even see a biometric comparison between my mesh and the BREP volume. These are things you can get to before, but you have to right click different places in the tree and now it's all in one spot. It's much easier for people to get access to them. Also, when you create a bunch of these studies, eventually you want to delete some of them. Now you can just delete them on the tab without having to click on the tab and activate the, the actual study, which again, that would take maybe a couple moments to do, could it basically switch the graphics and everything else. Now it's like, no, I want to just delete you, delete you straight away. So again, just making that faster, uh, those things that you do all the time in SIM. This is a little bit different. This is more, I mean, it's a workflow maybe, but it's also just sort of uh, kind of a mashup that we couldn't do before. So basically we, now we can use uh, beam elements with thermal conditions which we could not do before. So, so something like this, to efficiently um, mesh it, I would use beam elements. So all those tubes would be beams, and I would describe them in the beam itself as what the diameter and thickness of material is. Now, that's fine for static stuff, but when I want to incorporate thermal loads, for example, for expansion and stress in there, I couldn't use beam elements. I'd have to actually mesh those with 3D mesh geometry across those thicknesses. It would take a much bigger mesh and a lot longer to solve. Now I can just basically mix them. I can have, yeah, I have beams in here, 
Oh, by the way, I'm going to go ahead and put a temperature on this, not a problem. Before, it just would not let you do that if you had beam elements. Or if I want to get thermal loads um, and I want to take that stuff out, I can do that. And I can also roll those thermal loads back into my static studies because, again, if you have thermal expansion, that can actually add stress to mechanical stress to the part. And for something like this, which is this, this, this move, this XY stage for my machine tool, I want to make sure I got to account for that. So in SARC 2020, the news is that thermal loads and boundary conditions and thermal studies can be, can all work with beam elements, whereas before you couldn't do that. Also, we're talking about assembly meshes here. We have, we have draft quality and we have high quality. And now in SARC 2020, I can just say, hey, you know, obviously draft quality is faster, but less accurate depending on what you're looking for. I just say, hey, everything's draft quality except for this part, that's gonna be high quality. So it makes it easy to be able to get the speed that I need, plus get the extra accuracy in certain areas that I, that I desire that. When you're doing connectors, like bolt connectors, pin connectors, in SOLIDWORKS 2020, we have a new, basically a new switch, a new different kind of math. Instead of just a rigid uh, connection, we can do a distributed connection. Functionally, what that does is it models the, the uh, connector differently, so we don't have the hot spots that would come up normally if we were doing a rigid connection uh, under those bolt heads. We have these little hot spots because that's just how the rigid connection works. Now it's more distributed overall, which is more realistic, to be honest. Both are still there. Uh, free body forces in simulation can be, uh, diagrams can be useful, um, but we couldn't do it with nonlinear. You know, a linear study is not nonlinear. Now we can do it with nonlinear stuff. You basically pick the, the time you want, time slice you want in your study, and then you can go ahead and then use it as normal to basically pick the parts you want to get the information on. Those are the pins. Tell it how that's restrained and then update. And now we're going to get our information out of there. So again, we could do free body forces, but we couldn't do it in that linear or a stack or dynamic. Now we can do that. I love the new enhancements in plastics because it works, it makes it work the way other simulation uh, in SOLIDWORKS works. So before you'd have to mesh your your plastics model, and then add your gates and your load and boundary conditions, which is kind of like opposite of what we were used to. So now in SARC 2020, I did not mesh this thing yet, but I can go ahead and set the domains and say, okay, your cavity, your runner, your cooling, that kind of stuff, and put all that in there without actually having to work in the mesh. I'm doing it right on the solid geometry, which again, is how simulation pro and premium and standard work and how flow works and things like that. And also go in here and say, okay, here's those, those cooling runners, add that stuff in here. Add my injection location, again, using the geometry and not having to mesh it and then pick a node, I can put it right in the geometry and the mesh will just accommodate that, which is kind of, again, what we really are used to in other types of uh, simulation in SOLIDWORKS. So this kind of brings that in there. I can do my coolant, lay these in here. Here's my input, here's my output what the flow rate is, all that stuff right inside of here, which is really also very nice. We'll do right in the geometry. Because again, that's that's what we do, right? We model geometry in SOLIDWORKS, whether it's discrete like part geometry, whether it's representation like this is much easier to do than describing it elsewhere in the in a mesh. So results are easier to get to because setting up the problem is easier and faster um, in SOLIDWORKS Plastics 2020. Flow simulation, a number of different enhancements there. Uh, I'm told by Madov uh, and Chris Olson that uh, Fandy rating and the heat exchanger model for porous media are a couple big things. Again, you can talk to them for more details on that. And we talked about improved performance and streamlined workflow. We've been at this, um, well, our mind's a little different than um, in person, I guess. So we can continue on. I'm game if you are, so let's go ahead. And let's talk about the connected ecosystem. So when I talk about connected ecosystem, it's working with other systems, and that includes other CAD systems. We did interconnect was introduced in 2017 to allow us to take 
native and also neutral formats now, step files, IGES, Inventor, Creo, whatever, take these models directly into our designs in SOLIDWORKS and use them without translating. They're native models. We've been adding formats as we go all the time. I think last year we added JT. Now we can do this with 3D, DXF, and DWG as long as there's actual BREP, 3D boundary representation in there, not just wireframe. And then also IFC Industry Foundation class, which is more of an AEC kind of exchange. So a couple of new formats. But one of my favorite things um, about 3D Interconnect now is I can use my standard drag and drop method to take things into my SOLIDWORKS assemblies. So I'm used to just going into PDM or a SOLIDWORKS window, finding my part, my step assembly, and drag, dragging it into my SOLIDWORKS model. You could not do this with, in this case, as a step file. I'm just dragging and dropping it into SOLIDWORKS assembly and then I'll made it up as normal. Before, in order to do this, I'd have to go through the insert components workflow directly. That I'm always using that, that workflow. Now I can use my drag and drop workflow, which quite honestly, I think most people do. Um, again, just really simple. You drag and drop whatever it is, as long as it's something that interconnect and read, which is pretty much anything. It'll drag and drop it in there. It'll be like a floating part. You can make it up. It's still directly um, looking at the native file on this. So in this case, I have these step files that have not been that have just been sitting there, and I'm just re live referencing them. Simple as that. So it makes it just easier. Uh, people sometimes didn't were do drag and drop, expecting that interconnected work, and it'd say, hey, you want to import, which is not the same thing. This just makes it easier to do. I should really change the title of the slide to add of manufacturing. 3D printing is something that's just sort of transforming in many cases to we're going to manufacture it. That's the manufacturing method, not just we're going to print a sample of it before we make the real part. Uh, now we're seeing more and more people make the real part directly using our Mark Forge systems, for example, or composite or metal, uh, or just high volume uh, nylon 12 stuff um, in our HP volume system. So in 2020, I can go ahead and set up my favorite. So I'll put my HP system in here or a Mark Forge in there or whatever. I can go ahead and put a couple of those in to favorites. So I'm not always going through the UI to find these. And why am I going to set the 3D printing up in SOLIDWORKS? I'm not actually going to slice it here. I could, but no, I just want to see if this is going to fit in the envelope. And by doing this, I can see, oh, okay, I got an offset from the bottom up there. So we're good in Z. I'll go ahead and have it rotate and fit it so I can get this part if I'm going to manufacture it in 3D printing I can see where the supports will be if I'm doing an FTM process. Uh, I could do slicing in here, although again, usually for like for the sophisticated systems like Mark Forge and HP, they have their own systems, they'll do that. But as I'm creating these parts, I can see, hey, is this going to fit in the build envelope? How is it should be oriented and stuff like that. Now, what's more important, I think, is that now we can write a uh, different file format. So a 3MF file doesn't just show the geometry, but include materials and appearances. So color, for example. So if I'm printing things on an HP 580 and the colors are in the SOX model, it'll just print the colors. Whereas before, because STL is geometry only, I'd have to recolor them in the HP side. And then if you don't have access to printing at all, and you want to do sort of a lending tree type approach, this is a nice uh, tool available on the 3D Experience platform where I can basically say, here's my upload my part, say these materials I want, finishes I want, and hey, you guys, you know, 44 service providers can make this, you go ahead and, uh, and quote me on it if you want to. So it helps me do that. SOLIDWORKS CAM, now remember, this is a couple of years ago, we've, everyone who has any version of SOLIDWORKS has SOLIDWORKS CAM standard, which is two and a half axis, milling for single parts. Two of the three top enhancements in CAM for 2020 are for the standard software that everyone has. The programming routine is, in, for, is for Pro. Let's take a look at a couple of these things. Again, how easily and how SOLIDWORKS-esque these enhancements are. So if I'm going to cut out these holes in this, in this uh, metal plate for my cover of my OMAX, one thing I don't want to necessarily have happen is the material that's cut out to drop into my machine as I'm doing this. So I might want to leave some tabs so they're kind of hanging on. I can use a mallet to knock them out after the fact. The way we do that in SOLIDWORKS CAM 2020 now is just add tab cutting to whatever 
toolpath we already have. So I had that circular toolpath. I say, I want to do tab cutting. It says, okay, how many do you want? It's going to equal space them. I can change those instances and change the space of any one of those tabs that I wish. I can accommodate cutter um, length and thickness if that's how I'm going to cut it, not like with a wire drip or with an actual cutter. I can do my offsets. I can determine my lead in and out, the size of these things, all that stuff. And again, I'm just applying it to an existing toolpath. And then when I do that, you can kind of see what's happening there. I'll do a, a regeneration of that same toolpath. Let's go ahead and simulate it. And as you play, you can see now the same you know, circular cut path, but now it's kind of bumping out four times to leave a little material for knockout. Here's another one that's super easy. Again, this is that and this are both in standard. Everyone gets this. I can basically look at it from the, the standpoint of my two and a half axis cutting direction and say, hey, you know, all the edges, just go ahead and break those with a chamfer. Just do it. I don't have to select anything. Just look at it, tell it what size I want, and I'll just do it. It's like super easy. And it's intelligent, of course, so as it runs and processes the toolpath, it'll step out, it'll walk away if it comes to a, to a, a right angle corner, like down in the corner there. So you can see it, it, it goes through and then pulls away a little bit and does all those horizontal edges from the point of view of the toolpath, which is exactly what you want to do in many cases. So I don't even have to really create a camper toolpath. I just say, hey, look at this and do it for me, and it does it. That's a very SOLIDWORKS kind of enhancement, right? For people who are doing SOLIDWORKS professional, uh, CAM professional, or into the CAM works and multi-axis type stuff, um, one of the things that can happen when you're when you're doing machining and really high precision stuff is you know you want to make sure that you kind of reset your zero before you do certain operations if they're really really holding tight tolerances. And before you'd be basically doing this at the machine itself and putting those probe routines in. Now in SOLIDWORKS we can actually just do them like a regular toolpath. So I say insert a probing operation, you have your crib of, of probes, go ahead and, and make that operation. That basically say, okay, um, what, what are we doing, X, Y, or a Z? In this case, I'll do X, Y, I'll reset those on these two faces. And then what am I gonna do with that? I'm gonna update the WCS offset, put it in there and it's done. Now, as this is an operation, I can change the order of the operation. So I can put it right before or change what I'm doing um, after this and before this. And again, the verification is very simple, right? It's just like, okay, here's a probe, dink and dink, and now we're good, right? So I can do that right inside here. Another type of uh, probe we might wanna do is a, is a Z. So before I do that, that really thin groove, I'm gonna wanna go ahead and reset my Z on the top inside surface there, like that. Just add the operation, set it that we're gonna do our work coordinate from there, and then for Z. And then again, as we turn the toolpath, Right before we do that that other cut, I'm going to go ahead and grab the probe, and then just set my Z there, and then go from there for the for the next operation. So, tab cutting, auto break edges are part of SOLIDWORKS standard. Everyone has that. People are using SOLIDWORKS um, CAM Professional, or if they're using CAMWORKS now, you can have these probing routines um, built right into your into the uh, the strategy there. Let's see here, SOLIDWORKS Composer, a couple of things that we've done here. Again, looking at different possible um, enhancements, what we've concentrated on in 2020 for Composer is just making more use of what's already there, having different outputs that are more um, kind of modern sort of formats, I guess you could say. So in SOLIDWORKS, people, you know, engineers, they tend to have, you know, explored the views and different camera angles, things like that for their own purposes. Sometimes that's useful on the Composer side. So now when we open up a SOLIDWORKS assembly in Composer, we have an option to bring in explore views and save views. When we do that, it's going to make a, a, a Composer view for every SOLIDWORKS camera view, but also every step in the explode step, it's going to create Sour or Composer views as well. I can just, I'll put those, I can use those as a basis for throwing an animation. And then when I make my animation and save them off, I can now go directly to MP4. Basically, that's what everyone uses. I don't have to do an AVI and then cross or transcode it later on. For 3D sort of web spin around applications, it can be useful to have a whole bunch of 360 captures along an axis. And in SOLIDWORKS Composer 2020, we can now do that automatically. Just say what axis I want, how many do I want to go around it. As I output this, these are all individual JPEGs, but I can drop this in a web page and I can have that sort of way for a user to use their arrow keys or their mouse 
or touch screen to rotate something when I don't, it's just a 2D picture series. You can do that with, with uh, render views as well as um, hidden line removed vector graphics too. E-drawings VR, if you've been to our, uh, our um, technology center, you probably uh, looked at this in beta from last year. If you've been to some of the user groups around, I brought this around a little bit because at E3D last month. Um, basically, what we've done with e with uh, virtual reality in e-drawings professional is just up the ante with the graphics. So, I mean, the observatory was really cool and you could walk around it was really neat. But when we do our, our kids camp, uh, the kids kind of commented, you know, that the graphics were, um, well, their word was different, but it was plain, right? So we didn't really have shadows or any of that stuff. So now what we've done in eDrawings Professional 2020 is, first of all, VR is released. It's not beta anymore. And we just amped up the graphics just beyond it to 11, right? So now we're using everything, reflections, real shadows, ambient occlusion, transparencies, um, we're, we're, we have a lot more control over the floor and the sky. Uh, we can scale them. We can add a horizon sort of a fade there and make it more realistic. Um, you can do this without a headset. If you want to just pop this up and navigate with a mouse like we're showing here. Of course, with a headset, it's even more impressive. I mean, I literally, even though we don't have one here at GSC, I have been, I've stood next to an Omax, Micromax. I've actually put my head through the door, looked around the inside. I stood on top of it, looked around the whole 360. I mean, it it's, gives you the feeling that the thing is there and it's really impressive. And again, this is just part of what's in SolidWorks eDrawings Professional 2020. So if you have SolidWorks, if you have eDrawings Pro 2020 separately, or if you have SolidWorks uh, Pro or Premium, your eDrawings is the pro level. And all you need to do is have a uh, machine that can handle VR, which basically is in the NVIDIA world, a P3200 or better. Um, laptops even have that. And then basically a $500 HTC Vive headset, and you can do this all day long. All you need is a top level assembly, and it's, it's, it works just seamlessly. So that is exciting development there. SARX PDM, we have a lot of customers using SARX PDM, and in many cases, they have multiple sites. And one of the things that we've seen enhanced in 2020 for PDM is just performance. And one of the cool things they did, they looked at how the uh, system was loading data. And as you see here, I can go right into these subfolders and click through them without having to have all the columns display the information. I have to wait for that. We basically changed the, the uh, system from being synchronous to asynchronous. So this is really, uh, really shows up if you have high latency networks, especially like over wider networks and things like that. Um, so I don't have to wait for the columns and the, and the stuff to show up for me to click on a, a model a part uh, to do something with it or to go into a folder or whatever. Just much faster, much snappier for those high latency networks. And across the board, you know, for all SARX users, whether you're using high WANs or not, we just basically improve the performance of the SOLIDWORKS add-in just making it faster in general, it updates faster. I can do things like check things in faster. It's just snappier. So we've just added under the hood enhancements across the board with the database being asynchronous, um, updating to the clients and also just having the retooling some of the stuff inside the SOLIDWORKS add-in to make things just faster and easier to work with. But one of my, again, top five favorite enhancements, right? We talked about detailing mode. We talked about uh, publishing envelope parts at the top level in the sub-assemblies, okay? And we talked about uh, flexible components, squishy parts. This is one of my top five things as well. Number four is the new quick search in SOLIDWORKS PDM. So, you know, as I go through PDM, one of the things I want to do is search for things. And I can use that sort of, Windows Quick Search now usefully in PDM 2020. Uh, I can uh, search in any number of, of, uh, of up to six different areas or, or basically metadata columns if I want to. And it remembers my searches, I can clear the search history and I can use uh, logic like and, ors and nots right inside here. I can choose which of the six um, elements that this is your user, your admin sets up which ones you're gonna have available to you. I can say I want latest version or all versions, current folder or not, and then it's just basically like Google. 
to go through and do it. Really nice and really handy. I love doing that. In your search cards, you can also make it so that a search card field uh, box will actually allow you to search across more than one uh, metadata field. So you can set that up if you want to and give your users more flexibility. And speaking of flexibility, your search results can now be reordered. Just drag and drop the columns in the order you like them and they'll stay that way. So some nice enhancements to searching inside of SOLIDWORKS PDM 2020. Now, a little more technical level, inside of the workflows for SOLIDWORKS PDM Professional, we now have a way to check the child reference date. This doesn't come up a lot, but depending on workflow and the training level of users and things like that, um, you know, it could be a situation where, you know, I have a drawing which naturally has a reference. Basically, a child of that is the part or the assembly model. And if that child reference is in a state in my workflow that is not able to be approved, for example, in PDM 2019 and earlier, it was possible for me to take that drawing and set it to approve. Again, normally people don't work that way. They put things together and that stuff. But again, it was technically possible to do that. Now in SARX 2020, I can set in my workflow, in my conditions, a check for that. So that if I try to submit a drawing for approval, but the models under change state, obviously I can't approve that, it won't let me approve the drawing. Only when the, the model is in the same development state, or in this case, if it's been approved, can I then go ahead and put the drawing on there. So that's, again, not something that people ran into a lot, but we've now made it possible for you to block that from even accidentally happening. So let's look at a couple of different um, use cases for this. So here is an example where I have a drawing, I have a model. I want to go and change the state and, and uh, approve this drawing, but it won't let me do it because, hey, it's checking the children and one of the references is in a condition that can't be done for. Well, that's because this thing is in an under change state. So, you know, I can't approve that along the way. So now only when I take the, the uh, child and take it out of a, uh, such a state, in this case, I'll approve it. Then I can go ahead and approve the drawing as well. So this just keeps those kind of situations from cropping up. Again, usually people are putting these all along together anyway, but we have large environments, large workflows. We have multiple people. Maybe they're not talking at the same time or something happens. You know, just this is a way to just keep that from happening. Another situation that might happen is I have an assembly. And again, what do we have for children? References uh, for subassemblies and parts. I try to approve this assembly. It won't let me. And why is that? Because somewhere along the way, a part was added that maybe at the time it wasn't obsolete, but maybe it was obsolete along the way and that wasn't dealt with in this assembly. So now it will not let me use that obsolete part and I can't release it, so I can't release the overall assembly. I fix that, change it, do another part, a non-obsolete part, swap it in there, do that work. So it, it just catches those situations. So it makes them easier to use so if users don't have to worry about that aspect of it. It'll flag it for them. The web client for SOX PDM, basically as we develop, we're just basically trying to make it so that you can do more of what's in the regular client on your, you know, the thick client, if you will, um, in the web. So if I'm on a web page and I'm looking at it through a browser, I want to be able to see things like the history of my object. I can now do that right within the, within the web client here. I can also look at the bill materials, whether it's a basic BOM or it's a calculated BOM or whatever, do all that stuff right inside the web client. And when I download things with references before, I could do that and I could check these options here, but I didn't know what the results were going to be until I got the zip file. Now it actually shows me what's going on, gives me kind of reality check that what I've checked or turned on in terms of so I can expect, see what I'm going to get before I get it. Just making that, again, more like the regular SOLIDWORKS PDM client would behave in the web. SOLIDWORKS Manage, again, relatively new tool in the SOLIDWORKS uh, uh, platform, but this takes PDM to a whole nother level. We're managing not, you know, product data management type stuff, PD, you know, product data type stuff. We're managing people, resources, um, schedules, processes outside of just straight engineering. 
when you have a tool like manage it's all about dashboards and sometimes those dashboards are really useful for like departments to see not just the, the manager to see so in solidworks manage 2020 we now have a separate application tool which basically is a dashboard viewer it's running out whatever machine you want and not only can you see whatever dashboards are published but you can also automatically refresh it every x number of minutes or whatever so that way it stays up to date and you don't have to update that manually inside of manage itself manage also has a web client just like pdm does and again same kind of thing where as we develop the manage web client we're just adding functionality in order of, of importance basically so people can do more inside of manage while using just a regular web browser on a laptop or a mobile device that's what's going on here you can even do workflows charts things like that right from inside of the web client including kicking up processes one of the again this is just like an mbd there aren't you know out of six million people there aren't like you know millions of people using manage right now there are people that are getting into it we, again a couple hundred seats out there people are starting to implement this and and that we're seeing that and again those people have a very clear voice a very loud voice in the development of these products that helps them get what they want first so one of the things we heard a lot about was outlook integration people still use outlook for the email of course so now in Sox Manage 2020, we have a, a managed tab right inside of Microsoft Outlook. So if I have an email that pertains to something that I know is in Manage, I can go ahead and just add that record, that email right inside of Manage. It'll bring up Manage for me. In this case, I'm looking at assembly here. I'm gonna, uh, or in this case, a part, go in and grab that, put that, in, that link in there and add from Outlook. So now there's going to be a live record and manage if i go in the manage user interface you know, somebody else looking around or whatever they look at this part now they see there's an emails tab that's new and there's the email and if i look at that guess what it brings up the outlook message it's not like a snapshot or a picture of it it's actually the outlook message linked directly in manage inside of sarx pdm because we go from pdm to manage and back and forth they kind of they talk to each other we have amongst our regular tabs inside of Sox PDM, we have a manage tab, which lets us do manage things inside of PDM. And of course, the new email tab is there as well. So now I can go ahead and look at this part, see the emails are related to it, do other kind of things like the where you use it, it looks in the ECO, all those processes, basically being able to see more in the manage world in from the PDM client and vice versa. Sox Manage allows us to do different kinds of process management. Basically, any kind of process you would do, a business process, can be managed in here. So I look at a process overview. You know, um, I can see these different ones here. And then as I use these, okay, I might have different paths. Now, when I do a new process, like I'm going to do an ECO right now inside of Manage, there's things I want to attach, of course, to that ECO. Now, I can always attach the you know i go with the target i'm attaching a part or something right or a drawing to an eco yeah i'm going to do that or assembly but there's ancillary and related stuff i want to add too now in socks manage in 2020 i can just say add related records and then where used the bio information stuff that's in manage or in pdm all rolls up there and then go ahead and pick and choose what i want to include along as reference items to this process so before i had to go and pick each one of those separately find it and add it in now I can say, hey, what's related to it, and grab whatever I need. We also have the ability to do sub processes too. So if I add an ECO here, and I have these different paths, okay, well there's there's a couple of different ones I want to do, and as I add this in here, some of these might want to go through path A, and some might want to go through path B, and I can go ahead and do that now. I'm going to move some of this to a sub process, grab the stuff I want to copy along with it. And it'll make a sub process for that with those items I want to split out and it'll maintain that reference of the sub process to the top level process. Again, before I had to actually do two sub processes. Now they're all one shot. I'm just going ahead and referencing a sub process for some of those. So it goes to a different approval path, basically a faster path. So look at this now. I can include an express and standard path right through this process in the same shot.
Product manager is also part of Sox Manage. Again, the idea with Manage is, you know, instead of using PDM and then Outlook and Excel and like sort of project and all this other stuff to, you know, to manage these other things, you can do it all inside of a purpose-built tool in Manage and have it talk to and communicate with PDM directly. So as I create things like Gantt charts, research charts, I might be working with someone who is still using Microsoft Project or an outside person. In 2020, we can import data from Microsoft Project into our managed projects. So that way it'll create the resources and the milestone dates and all stuff for us directly from the pro Microsoft Project information so I don't have to recreate it. Also, we can do more chart types. You know, so things like load charts and per charts and network diagrams, those are things, again, people use Microsoft Project for. The idea is use manage. The idea with manage is to have everything contained in the system that can do whatever you need to do. And as we develop it, again, people are telling SOLIDWORKS what to do next. We add users in here. We can see their, their uh, burden rate, you know, um, their, their hours available. We can see when they're on vacation or absent or whatever, and all that stuff is available to us as we continue on in mass or managing people and processes and all those things outside of the you know direct product data, but hand in glove with the product data management system and SOLIDWORKS itself. And then in terms of tasks, you can create tasks inside of Manage here as well. And then now in SOLIDWORKS 20, uh, Manage 2020, we have templates. So if I look at this, this housing here and I wanna do a task I can assign a template to it and have all that information come along automatically instead of doing it separately in each step. For people using SOLIDWORKS Electrical, we have a couple nice enhancements that people have asked for. So in, in SOLIDWORKS Electrical Schematic, we have a database and you have users that have different access levels. We had a couple pre-generated sort of profiles for different access rights. Now in SOLIDWORKS Electrical Schematic 2020, you can make your own. So if I'm a contractor, for example, add that in there and he had, that contractor type has certain rights. I'll take them away. I can mix and match those and get exactly the profile I need for a given user. When you're doing electrical schematics, a lot of what you spend time on is creating reports and making those reports look the way you want them to do. To format those is easier than ever in SOLIDWORKS Electrical Schematic 2020. We now have direct access to being able to vary things like the text height and the, and the uh, spacing of the headers versus the overall content. You could do this before, but you'd be writing SQL report code. This is just on the UI, so I can just see what's going on. You can see a preview of that. Uh, also, a lot of times people want to have a numbered column on the left. Again, that's just something that you can just now do before you have to add a line of SQL in there to get that done. So making that formatting, just making it easier right as part of the UI to create what you want and get the exact kind of format you like. Also in SOLIDWORKS Schematics 2020, you now have leaders for your balloons and your text notes automatically attached. So it's real simple. I do a block leader and just click on a block and click out where I want to drop out add the information and the leaders attached to where I want it to be. Nice and neat. Projects are preview as you, as you mouse over them in the project system. Um, we have some other nice things like new formula variables, UI consistency for title blocks in the project manager, ability to paste special stuff. I mean, there's some new stuff there. Again, Claire, Schaefer, or Evan would be able to talk to you more about it if you really want to know the details there. In the electrical 3D and routing in general, one thing we that's we've always had overlooking is wires and cables didn't have mass properties. Now a lot of times it's not a big deal, but if you're looking at like for example the Monte Cast Spectroscopic Explorer, which is you know about 195,000 kilograms, it's a huge thing, right? It's like a five-story building that has to tilt and rotate to four decimal degree, four decimal place accuracy. Weight and moments of inertia are important, so when we have lots of cables. You know, before cables, they didn't have any weight. So now it's just a simple matter of in the library, you just say, here's what the weight. So mass per whatever, you know, linear uh, unit there is, we can uh, take into account partial coverings and things as well. And just roll all that stuff up 
um, into the overall mass and the mass properties of our assembly. So when you're doing large assemblies, things like that, you can actually take into account um, massive amounts of of, um, of cabling and having that roll into your mass properties. Other things that are nice and routing, you can now splice without having component present. I um, can create connector blocks directly, a couple new items for bend radius and, and a flatten route. That's electrical wire harnessing, okay? On the other side of the coin, we have, you know, again, people are doing any kind of product development. If you're not having something electronic in there, like a PC board, something that connects to a smartphone or Bluetooth or internet or whatever, you're going to. I mean, everything's going that way, right? I mean, I, I have my SolidWorks, my wonderful Contigo SolidWorks water bottle here right next to me. It was designed in SolidWorks. It's beautiful. It's wonderful. But the one thing that annoys me is I have to manually enter in how many glasses of water I drink every day into my smartphone app. Why doesn't it just count them for me and tell it as I go? That would be really nice. Someone should develop a smart water bottle for that. You can charge 50 bucks and people would buy it like crazy. Okay. I have a frying pan. I'm making some eggs at home. I gotta step away because I gotta, you know, answer the door or whatever. I like it so that, you know, if, if things get too hot, it tells me and gives me an alarm, you know, stuff like that. So I think everything's gonna have electronics. We already see that now. And as such, we have SolidWorks PCB. And what we've seen in SolidWorks PCB 2020 are some great enhancements to communicate with SolidWorks mechanical users, as well as some really great integration with PDM and this rigid flexible um, capability. So here I have my anemometer and I have electronics in there, PC board, display, and the PC, bird, the PC designer is going to make the board, I give them kind of specifications as to how big my housing is. And as soon as we start working with together in our design environment, of course, we might want to be doing stuff in PDM. So when we have templates, create a new folder structure, for example, we wanna not just have SOLIDWORKS files created automatically, but also it would be nice to be able to create some PCB stuff as well. And we can now do that directly as part of our, our templates in SOLIDWORKS PDM uh, Professional 2020. But going back to the design side here, here's the board. Okay, yeah, it's kind of the shape of the overall housing, but in real life, that's not gonna cut it, okay? I need like this to actually flex up to meet that, that window. So, hey, can you make the middle section flexible, which is a thing, you know, drop your cell phone, you'll look inside there, there's a lot of more flexible PC boards than rigid. And, you know, I'll just suggest, hey, I need a couple bends in there. So, okay, inside PCB, brand new in 2020, I can say this section of my PC board is a rigid section, I'm gonna flex it, but this section, this one's gonna be a flex section and it basically add bends. I'll just go ahead and tell it an angle. I'm gonna guess, you know, put a radius in there. We'll do one, we'll do another one to find another bending line. It's, it's kind of like solid sheet metal from flat to, to folded. And I'll add a couple, again, just random dimension there, kind of get it going. Because again, I can't see what's in SOLIDWORKS right now, but I'm just kind of adding that in there as a SOLIDWORKS person adding and communicate back. This is new. Go back in the SOLIDWORKS side, they accept those changes and see what the results are, and I get this. And, oh, it looks pretty good. When I put it in here, position it though, I need to be able to change some of those bends. Guess what? They're parametric dimensions. So I can go ahead and save that angle and change it to where I need to be. And it ends up being 78 degrees or whatever. It kind of fits in pretty good. Awesome. We will save that change, and I'll go ahead and communicate back to the PCB user. Hey, I had to modify that second bend. So I fit in there just for completeness. They'll get that communication, that change, and then I can verify that right inside of PCB, and then we when you're dropping these files out of PCB, like Gerber files and things like that, you know those are related to the, the PCB model itself. And in now in SOLIDWORKS PCB, we have a PDM integration that lets me check all this stuff in. So I'm in P, PDM here, check in. And as it checks them in, it knows the parent trial relationships, just as if they were parts and assemblies and, and uh, drawings. We have all that in there. I can version them all together, all that kind of stuff, making the PDM environment really very, very accommodating and very utilitarian for people using PCB. So as we add electronics to our to our mechanical devices, as we bring electronics 
uh, files and designs in house, we have a much better way to communicate that when they're using SARS PCB, which by the way, I should mention is based on Altium, which is an industry standard technology to begin with. So this is not a brand new out of left field thing. Okay. My fifth favorite thing in SOLIDWORKS 2020 platform is IES light profiles, Illumination Engineering Society light profiles in SOLIDWORKS Visualize. And the reason I'm excited about that is because when you're using a light, a, a light source, you typically are buying them, whether I'm doing it inside my uh, machine tool, I'm doing some point of purchase display or cabinetry uh, or anything like that, I'm gonna buy a light from somewhere and almost every manufacturer for just about everything they make is going to have an IES light profile. What does that do? It tells me the color temperature of the light itself, it tells me the, the fall off in intensity, attenuation, it tells me if it's got a light cone, you know, if it's a spotlight, what the light cone is, what the fall off, all that stuff. So it's already there. Now inside of rendering tools like Visualize and other tools, you say, I may have spotlight, and then you tell it what you have sliders, what's the intensity, what's the color, what's the angle. You have to manually set all that and mess around with it to get it to look like the real life light would be. No longer in SOLIDWORKS Visualize 2020, I say, ah, spotlight. Oh, by the way, here's the IS light profile I downloaded from the manufacturer website. Use that, and boom, all the sliders, all the stuff is set, and it renders accurately the way the manufacturer intends it to right inside of the Visualize. It makes setting up real life uh, systems with lighting so much faster. And we also at GSC happen to have a number of customers who create these lights and they wanna be able to use their own IS light profiles in their models, boom, now we can do that. Another mention here, I think Visualize having SOLIDWORKS PDM integration, that basically I think is everything that's not inside of SOLIDWORKS, all the ancillary tools, we have Composer last year, PCB, Visualize, we had Inspection last year, I think everybody is now has their own integration in the PDM in 2020 here. Now, if you have configurable products that you want to be able to sell on a website, there are a couple of different options you can use. We do have in SOLIDWORKS platform, uh, we do have something called SOLIDWORKS Sell, which enables you to essentially make a website uh, page on your regular website, links to that, and allows you to do things like, you know, change the color and anything that you have a configuration mapped out for in your SOLIDWORKS model can be webified, okay? So for things that don't have a lot of options, you know, you have just some different colors, different nozzle types, you know, in the OMAX world, if this were only one size, this might be okay. Um, and again, for consumer products, they let water bottles, okay, how many different colors do I have in the water bottle, different tops, whatever. But for most of our customers, size comes into play as well. I have different sizes I want to do. And then there are rules to that. If it gets to a certain size, I got to use different kind, of, um, different kind of material and whatever. So while Solar Cell is a good sort of a basic level sort of configurator for the web, to be quite honest, if you work with us at GSC, you already know that we, we really advocate Driveworks for this. Because Driveworks does all the AR stuff and all the web stuff and everything else. Actually, it does it better than than sell, and also you can incorporate rules. So if I'm not just selling one size of a water jet, but I'm selling 10 sizes of water jet, or 100 sizes of water jet, or I have conditions like it gets a certain size, switch from casters of feed and stuff like that, you can put all those rules in. Otherwise, if you had to put, if you had to make SOLIDWORKS configurations for every last one of those combinations, it would be astronomical in terms of the amount of work. So while you might hear about SOLIDWORKS Cell and it is a viable tool for certain situations, Talk to us at GSC, go and do automation and, and webify things for websites and things, and we'll steer you in the right direction, whether it's sell or very likely it'll probably be, end up being dry works. But sell is part of the SOLIDWORKS platform offering, so I want to definitely make you aware of it. And lastly, we have a very popular tool. Again, a lot of our GSC customers are in the plastics industry, plastic molding. And a lot of those companies already are using a tool called IQMS to do their uh, accounting manufacturing system, you know, connections, they're basically their MRP system. And now that IQMS system is owned by Deso Systems and it's called Delmia Works. So this is a new tool that's available. And IQMS has been around for many, many years. 
well established, but now it's in part of the, the SOLIDWORKS um, that works family. And so you'll see, of course, a lot more uh, work and development being done to really integrate that directly with all the stuff we do already with SOLIDWORKS and with PDM and things like that. So that if you're an AccuMS user, understand that now the names be changed to AlmiaWorks. Um, and then, you know, I'm sure the first, very first version of this is going to be basically just changing the name and, and branding and that. But as we go on, there's, of course, opportunity to um, make a lot of different enhancements to what's now called the Almea Works to really even integrate better with the SOLIDWORKS platform overall. So what we've done is we've gone through the connected ecosystem, um, just again, across the board, how do SOLIDWORKS users connect with elsewhere in the company or outside the company in different systems, whether it's CAD, management, um, MRP, whatever. Of course, we've got streamlined workflows. You'll see more of this, again, as you saw some of the stuff I talked about this morning, but there's a lot more out there. Again, as you use your tools, you'll kind of notice, oh, that's a new option, or oh, that, that's, what is that? And you, you know, you just look at the help for some of the tools you use every day. You'll find these little tidbits all over the place. I think the What's New PDF is, again, over 250 pages again this year. And then, of course, improved performance. That, if there's nothing else in SOLIDWORKS 2020 new at all, I would still tell you that if you're on SOLIDWORKS 2019 or 2018 or 17 or heck, 2001 plus or whatever version you're currently on, your next upgrade should be SOLIDWORKS 2020. So, you know, some some people are like, well, we're on 2017, and we're planning on going to 2019 this, you know, uh, during the shutdown or something like that or whatever uh, over the holidays of like, don't do that. I would go to 2020. Well, we have to wait for SARS Service Pack 3 because that's our current policy. Then I'd say wait till whatever that comes out because we between having the new graphics pipeline, having LDR edit mode being so pervasive and detail mode, which is only in 2020. And by the way, most of what you do in drawings, you can do in detail mode. It makes such a huge performance leap that even if you have to wait a number of months for a magic service pack to come out that whatever your company is, I would wait. Unless you can do 2019 like now and then 2020 like in, in five months or three months or whatever, um, if you get that once a year or once every 18 months type of cycle for IT um, um, attention, I would use that for 2020 it is that profound in terms of just everyday performance it's it's very very stark when you use it so that concludes the kind of overview of what's new in solidworks 2020 uh, i'm going to go ahead and take a look and see if anybody has typed in any questions into the system here Okay, if you haven't typed in any questions um, right in the in the uh, the GoToWebinar widget, you can go ahead and do that at this time, and I'll wait and see if anybody has any questions. All right, let's see here. Okay, well, I'm not seeing any questions being asked, so. Um, Hopefully you've all seen a number of things in SARS 2020 that gets you excited to go ahead and try it again. The performance is hard to convey how much different it is, especially again, drawings in detail mode. I would encourage you to just basically ingrain detail mode into your general overall uh, working with drawings. It is such a huge time saver. And again, you can do quite a bit of it, uh, but if there are no other questions. I'll go ahead and uh, and close by thanking everybody um, for for coming in and um, and sitting down with me and going through the highlights of what's new in SOLIDWORKS 2020.